Good morning. I have to say I'm pleasantly surprised so many people were able to get out. I did get a couple calls of people that weren't going to be here because of being plowed in and because they were going to be doing other things. So uh, welcome uh, to East Orrington Congregational Church. Welcome as a family of, of God as we uh, gather together to worship the one true God. Uh, Tuesday night, I just want to bring a, a couple things in the light here. Tuesday night, the Lenten service will be held at the Brewer Methodist Church at 6 o'clock. And some of the men, we're going to try to arrange, some of the men will be going uh, to that service. And all of you are invited to, to if you haven't experienced a Lenten service, I think it's healthy to see other churches and, and what's going on there. Um, so you're invited to join some of the men and I and as we uh, celebrate Lent over at the Brewer Methodist Church. Also, Thursday at 3 o'clock. Uh, again, some of the men from the men's group, we decided, I don't know why, but we want to really experience Lenten journey, uh, that we, were gonna fa we are going to fast for 40 hours starting at 3 o'clock on Thursday. So that fast would last from 3 o'clock on Thursday till 7 a.m. Saturday morning. If you'd like to join us in that, um, and again, during that time when, when hunger strikes, we, we talk to God, and, and that's what it's about, to grow closer, nearer to our Lord and Savior. And so uh, I would love for you if, you, if you're interested, or even if you want to do it on your own, it doesn't matter, but let, let me know. Give me a call or give Dan Moore a call and, and just say, hey, what is this all about and how do I connect with you guys during this thing? And, and hopefully during Thursday, uh, Friday, I'll be sending out some devotions to help us on that, uh, during that trek. So this is just part of our journey with, um, with, with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I do want to make sure people are aware of if they haven't noticed, um, haven't seen it. Carol Lee Coral did pass away this past Wednesday night in, a, in a, one of the most beautiful ways. Uh, her eyes wide open. She was fully aware of everything going on. Um, and she was just full of joy. Uh, I, I don't know how else to describe it. It was absolutely beautiful. But she did pass away Wednesday evening. And the service will be later this spring, a memorial service and, and burial for Carol Lee. Uh, right after church... Uh, Doug, the call to Guatemala, how do you do that? Well, so, so who's making the call? Uh, they will call us. Okay, on your cell phone? Yes. Okay, I was going to say, if there's a way to do it, you could use the boardroom and the full speaker system so it's easier to hear and everybody can talk. Yes. Um, but I need to know because I will move the confirmation. Okay. Terrific. So confirmation group will be meeting at 1130 in the boardroom. Uh, I, I invite you. Mission board meeting will be uh, downstairs. And are you doing the Spanish group meeting today? No, that one's not going on today. So I also, I don't see him here. I don't see the Wilson crew here right today. But Zach Wilson uh, plays hockey for Hamden Academy. Uh, they pulled off a big upset over John Bapps. Uh, number four beat number one. So uh, they go into the state finals. I think it's Wednesday down in Colby. Uh, so uh, if you see him, if you see him downstairs, I, a lot of times he's downstairs. Uh, just let him know that uh, we're excited for him and his team as they uh, enter the uh, northern part, the hockey finals. <sighs> so before we bring the light of Christ in, once again, I... I, I Remind you, please do not walk around, but just rise and turn to your neighbor and friends. And if you want a fist bump, but just a nod and say hello and welcome to this family that we gather here at East Dorrington Congregational Church. So if you pass the peace with me by standing. And that's what Right Hand of Fellowship is about, to, to really relate how God is working in this church, the fellowship, the goodness of God in our life. 
I, who said that? Oh, I said, good morning, Debbie. So as we refocus and we get back into what we're here for, and that's to be in fellowship and to worship our God Almighty as uh, let us just center ourselves as the light of Christ is brought in for today's sanctuary. As we gather our thoughts and prepare ourselves for prayer, just before we do, think of something that you're thankful for. Let that be kind of in your in the front of your mind as we pray together. Because sometimes we only pray you hear the the worries and the things, but there's so much joy also that that's in our life. You know, I'm thankful right now as I'm looking out here for those that might be joining us on Facebook Live to to participate with us in, in prayer. And I encourage those that are on Facebook Live or watch us later to to pray out loud with us as well when we say the Lord's Prayer together. That we are connected and we are one in the body of, of Jesus Christ. So let us, God's people, join together in prayer. Gracious and holy God, Father, I thank you for... For everything, I thank you for your presence here right now through the Holy Spirit. I thank you for the direction you have given in my life. I thank you for all the different people that I have been blessed to be part of and knowing their story and their journey. Especially this past week, O oh Lord, to be with, with uh, Carol Lee and her family as um, I witness grace and I witness faith. Father, be with all of us as we walk out into this world of the unknown, that we all have our challenges and moments that we question and we wonder. We don't understand, and yet we continue our journey with you. Almighty God, I pray for this nation. I pray for our president. I pray for peace and unity to come about. I pray for those that are serving in the armed forces. I pray for the separation that often happens with families because of it. I pray that all involved, whether elected officials in the government, the state, or just locally, that we all allow your peace to be part of our life. That we hear the words that 
Our tongues need to be tamed. And our hearts need to be changed. May this peace of your son, Jesus Christ, overtake all of us. Even when we don't fully understand, O oh Lord, I know that when we surrender, we will see better. Father, I pray for all our first responders, those are the police and the, mil the fire departments, the DHS workers. I pray for our frontline workers in the hospitals and, and all around in the clinics who are constantly uh, being exposed to unknowns, being put in situations that needs compassion, knowledge, and understanding. Lord, I pray for this church family. I pray for those that find themselves alone and weary. I give great joy for those that are reaching out by making phone calls to each other, to other people within this congregation. Lord, I thank a particular person that spends two to three hours each week doing just this. Almighty God, thank you. Thank you for putting all kinds of people in my life that makes a difference. Journey with us, O oh Lord, and, and continue to bless this congregation as we will begin soon discerning our budget for next year. Put it upon our hearts of direction. Put it upon our hearts of, of an opening and, and the what, what lies ahead. May we be visionary, not be afraid, but walk out in boldness and give as you have asked us to do. Lord God, forgive us for our sins. Forgive us when, when we have other gods before us. Forgive us when we turn our back on those in need. Lord, may the joys of life, who we're thankful for, what we're thankful for, always be in our forefront, O oh Lord. May that erase how easy it is to fall into the trap of negativity. Lord, you're an awesome God. And the promises you have told us for me, O oh Lord, have come true. I have witnessed that when I surrender, you take over. My life is better. Father, bless us. Bless all those who uh, were working over the past 24 hours with all the different snowstorms. Thank you, O oh Lord, for Jim who did our parking lot for us. Father, my heart is full of gratitude. Lord, as we come together, we also know that not everybody has the joy at all times and the happiness or the financial stability. So, Lord, we take this time, have private prayers that we can lift up to you in a personal and private way. My God, hear our prayers. Father, I lift up our sister churches around the state and around the country and around the world. I lift up all people to your glory, Lord. Father, I pray for those that I may call my enemies. Help me forgive and help me move forward. Lord God, I close today's prayer with prayer for this church as um, many will participate with a 40-hour fast. Lead us and guide us. Nourish us, O oh Lord, as we go without. But Lord, may we grow in that experience, knowing who you are and that you can sustain us. Almighty God, I give you thanks and praise in your son's mighty name. And I turn to him and remember the prayer he taught us to pray that says,
first hymn, hymn number 141, Lift High the Cross. We're going to do all five verses. In times comes to us, or comes to me, and I'm sure you have thought it. Can what I give make a difference? No matter how small, I, or I can't give enough, well, can I make a difference? You know, I was watching a, a game the other day, and the third person that came on the bench, off the bench during a professional basketball game, was the leading scorer. Now, I'm sure in his head at times, he wanted to be the top five. He wanted to be one that out there and give it all, but he didn't come in until later in the game, giving basically half the game of what other people were giving, and he was the leading scorer. See, the point that I'm trying to make is, can I make a difference with what I give? The answer is resounding yes. No matter how big it is, how small it is, your gift combined with all the gifts of God people, makes a difference. I am witness of that. I share that story with many people of what your gifts have done for people. And so just know that no matter how big or how small, we are working 
together for God's kingdom out of love. So have a joyful heart and give what God is calling you to give as I invite the deacons for today's offertory. And gracious God, we thank you for the abundance that you have blessed us with as we look around and see the beauty of new fallen snow, the beauty of fellowship, the love that you have shared with all of us. Father, bless us and continue to bless us, O Lord, as, as we lay these gifts on their table. May they do your work here in this kingdom. May we discern before you and may we listen. Father, I thank you for the opportunity. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
Uh, the scripture lessons that we are going to be looking at today uh, come from both the Old Testament and the New Testament. The one comes from the book of Genesis in the very beginning, and the other one will come from the book of John, chapter 3, 1 through 17. And in that passage, uh, you will hear probably the most well-known passage in all of scripture that um, we will hear in 316. But before we do, we in this congregation, we ask the Lord to bless us in these readings, and we, we lift up a prayer to him as I invite you to join with me in today's unison prayer. Lord, upon the pages of this book is your story. It is also our story. Open our eyes that we may see, our ears that we may hear, our minds that we may understand, and our hearts that they may be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. So as I said, the two passages, the first one comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. And if you're at home, I hope you have your Bibles open, and then it'll be from uh, the Apostle John's letter uh, 3, 1 through 7. 17, I'm sorry. Genesis. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the people on the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. The second reading is John 3, 1 through 17. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with them. Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still your people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must also be lifted, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn it, but to save the world through him. This is the word of the Lord for our sake. May we understand and live in it. Amen. I think the children are coming in.
just enough room. You know, this passage that we read in John 3, 1 through 17, that one verse in chapter 16, verse 16, is critical. I think it is my understanding of what this whole book is about. That everything God's inspired word, if you believe this is the inspired word of God, then we have to hear what was said in verse 16. For God so loved the world, he sent his son. And so everything I read must go under the understanding that God gave me this because he loves me. So I need to read it through that, that light of what is God saying to me and how is it going to work in my life and, and, and change my life. Because if God loves me, wants the best for me, then I should pay attention to this. Agree? Okay. So in the story of Nicodemus, you'll hear many people in many messages, or, or maybe myself at one time, uh, Nicodemus went to Jesus at night, and they, they kind of explained it to him that, that was the, they were, he was sneaking around. He didn't want other Pharisees, the, the Roman, the, the Jewish leaders, see him going to Jesus. Or it was the only time he could schedule the, the appointment because he was a Pharisee and he was busy. But I wonder if in many ways we all don't come to Jesus at night in our times of, of darkness. See, the, the apostle writer, John, throughout his, his uh, uh, well, John uses the word night in a particular way I, I have read compared to other writers. John uses it to describe a condition or a circumstance. John's account of the night in the gospel is that night Jesus says, and, and John writes this in chapter 9, where Jesus says, it's night is when no one can see what's happening. Our visual, our usual daytime activities, Jesus would go on to say, have no power or meaning in night. We are unable in our own ways to be able to sustain, sustain life in night. People addicted to whatever it might be, whatever it is, it doesn't matter, or hiding something or, or not able to give forgiveness, understand that in their life they have two lives. And many call it the daytime life and the nighttime life. Not referring to sunlight and lack of sunlight, but concerning a condition within themselves. Jesus, I think, throughout Mark's, uh, John's gospel, throughout Gospels and the Bible itself speaks of night as time that we stumble because there is no light in us, as Jesus says, and we can't see the way forward. You can find that passage in John 11. John and <clears throat> the Apostle John talks about night as being a separation, a fragmentation, or a, or a division within us, and he also speaks of night in one of the stories of the upper room, which we're in this Lenten season, of betrayal of ourselves and to others. If you think about Judas, they could have told the story and he got up from the table, but John makes sure and says, it was not night. It wasn't that he did it during the night, it was night at that moment, as John points out. That was John 13. Night describes... <clears throat> There are times, well, another passage that John talks about is, and you remember maybe, that they fished all night long and caught absolutely nothing. You guys, some of you remember that? These are some of the disciples after Jesus had passed. They were out fishing all night and caught nothing, John 21. And our efforts prove fruitless and our nets remain empty if we fish in night or if we walk in night. Coming to Jesus by night is not a statement about an hour or time that many might say it. I, I see it totally different. I, I don't think it was a moment of Nicodemus' motive or his faith of why he went to Jesus at night. I don't think that has anything to do with how this love chapter, this love book, affects my life. It is for me knowing the Apostle John's writings as a whole, what he means by the word night. Night is a description of Nicodemus and his life. 
a description that probably fits all of us at one point or the other. Coming by night is the recognition that, that for, for Nicodemus that there was a daylight Nicodemus and there was a night light of Nicodemus. And as I thought about these two different Nicodemuses, the one that you see during the day that he knows he was a Pharisee, probably had all the confidence in the world, and the nighttime one that he's not quite so confident. He's asking questions. He's wondering what's going on. He wants to understand, but he can't understand things. The two different Nicodemuses, as I sat there thinking about that, that hit me. The different Carls that I live at times. The, the Carl that's full of light and, and want to be out there. And then at times, the Carl that can just shrink under the, the bed covers in darkness. Wondering if I make a difference. Wondering if God really chose the right one. Wondering if, if I'm following the right path. So this is how I see night. Is in those moments that you just... Not sure. See, Lent is a season to challenge yourself to step out in that mystery of night. To ask the questions, to, to follow the journey that you believe God is calling you to. To investigate and to hear his, his word. To hear the question in the nighttime, in his darkness that Nicodemus asks. How can these things be? See, he didn't understand. That was his night. That was that moment he's out there. And night in the darkness, nothing makes sense. And he was looking for answers and understanding. He's not the only one that had to step out in night and be challenged in Scripture. On the night of the Last Supper, if you remember Thomas, how can we know the way, Lord? See, he wasn't understanding what was happening. He was questioning. He was in that moment of doubt. Many questions. Oh, well, Mary questions Gabriel when he comes to her and says, you will be the carrier of the Son of God. And Mary says, how can this be since I'm a virgin? That was her night moment. Before Mary, it was Zechariah. And if you remember the story of Zechariah, him and Elizabeth, they were told to have a baby at a very old age. How will I know that this is so? How can I trust you, God? See, in that time of not understanding. And I believe with everything I have that Abram must have wondered, how can I leave my country? How can I leave my family, my kinfolk? And my father's house. These are biblical stories that are throughout the Bible. And there's so many more talking about the nights that they, they were in wonderment. They were questioning. They were not sure. They weren't understanding. <clears throat> Other people stepping out in the, in the night. But these are also our stories. You know that prayer that we says, this is your book, but it's also our book, our stories? Well, that's, I, I, I see that in this passage so clearly. There are times in each of our lives when understanding and knowing gives way to the, to the night or the darkness of not knowing and not understanding. I have found the journey of, my, my journey of faith, if I, when I think about this, is often a journey through the night and the darkness of life. Maybe we all fully come to Jesus, I thought, through the night. I know some of your stories of, of how you became part of this incredible church. Someone dies and you're in that darkness, you're looking for answers, and it brings you to a church. Or you're addicted and, and something happens, something starts kind of popping within you and you just want more. You've got to figure this out, but you don't have the answers. See, whether it's through a call from God, which I believe I heard God in my life, or a crisis in life, or, or the circumstances that, that we created or, or outside created for you, you find yourself in, 
we must step into the nighttime of our own lives. We must take that step into the mystery. See, the times we seek something more. When I feel isolated and alone in that dark time, in my night, I reach for God. When stability of life is disrupted, financial woes seem overbearing and and how am I ever going to get out? Our confidence levels shrivels and we find ourselves asking more questions than there are answers. There are times when we step out in the night and we know fear. We feel powerless or so overwhelmed with what lies ahead. Any of these clicking with you yet? See, that's night. That is, that is the times that, that we realize, I want to hold on to something. I want that anchor. But I feel that it's not there. See, I've been there. I've been there, folks. I felt the call, and I, I, I understand what it's like to want to hold on to what I had so bad. Because I had a good life, and now I have a better life. I don't know how it happened. And see, I know what it's like, and I bet many of you do too. I'll bet each of you have your story about that moment when you walked out into the night. The nighttime of your life. Losing a loved one. Or feeling stress of a job. Or have to make a, a decision. Whatever it might be. Stepping further into the night of questions and doubts. But also you step into the, to the possibilities and direction. See, I, I've heard so many times of people that have, have turned to where Nicodemus was and stepped out in the night because they knew there was something more. But they didn't know what. But they took that courageous step of saying, I need to walk in the night. We know there is more. We want answers instead of questions and, and, and certainty. How many of you want certainty in your life? And I'm telling you, it's never going to happen completely. Sort of. See, we want light instead of shadows. We want answers instead of questions. In the nighttime of life, there are no answers. So I'm going to tell you that right now. When you walk out in that night, you will not find the answer that you always seek that with that certainty and absoluteness, except that there will be in that night the promises of God. That's the absolute. Do you remember the promises that God says to Abram that I just read? His promise to Abram was, I will. I will. Abram, if you step out into your night, into your questions and your wanderings, the mystery of the unknown, the nighttime of life, I will make you. I will bless you, God tells Abram. And I believe that is true for us. Certainly in my life, I have found this to be true. Certainly in those that I have sat with, and they, they took this step out, out of faith, into that mystery, and started asking questions, they have found this to be true. See, in my life, I have found it to be true in my nighttime moments. Where I step out into the mystery of faith, I have found the promises of God. The nighttime of light is not a time to try to gather more data. Many people think that's what we should do. You know, you ever been in those overwhelming situations? I just got to reach, I got to grab, I got to get everything outside of me. You try harder, you, you do more, you try to make sense of what is happening. But the nighttime of life is not about gathering, it's about surrendering. It's about letting go. It's about letting God be. In the time of surrendering to God, it is opening ourselves 
to God's dreaming for us and his love for us. It is a time of trusting that there is more hidden in the darkness than what we can see. See, when I was in the seminary and I, I had all these questions and the, they, they would try to answer me, well, this is what ministry is about, this is what it's about, this is what it's about. And Dan Moore, I don't know how many times he has said, so this is what you thought ministry was. And, and, we, and, and what's been exposed is the beauty of people. It has nothing to do with just ministry. It's the beauty of people that brings the ministry to life. It's those walking in darkness and all of a sudden they, they get a hold of something. They start surrendering. They start letting go. And they start seeing for themselves the promises of God. In a time of letting the wind of God just blow, as Scripture says, where it will. And let it change our lives. It is a time to walk humbly before God. And letting ourselves be born anew. That's what happens when we walk out into the nighttime. Folks, in the nighttime of life, the problem is not the darkness. The problem is our fear. The problem is our confusion and not understanding what the nighttime life is really about. And what it's about is new life that can happen. No matter how, how good life was at one time when you take a step out into the night, the promises of God are even better than what you could imagine. What if the night is the means by which God transforms us, transforms our lives, and calls us to even be a truer you, a truer me? What if we experience night as an invitation that God is inviting us into himself? What if we trusted and we, we understand that new life and light is born out of darkness? See, that's what it, I believe it was for Nicodemus. His new life was born out of night. It's what happened for Thomas and Mary, and Zechariah, and Abram, and Sarah, and, 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 Sarai and, and so many others in the scriptures, but so many of us here. It was in those dark moments that when we started surrendering and thinking, knowing that there's a greater power, there's someone who loves us beyond what we can understand, his promises become real. In fact, if we read the beginning of Genesis, all of creation came out of darkness. In the nighttime of life, for those who are just beginning their journey, I'll use a metaphor, it takes a while for your, nights, your eyes to adjust to the night. Right? That's the same way it is. It will take time to adjust to your journey at night with God. It's not so much looking for the light around us as it is discovering the light within you that has always been there and will be there. The light of Christ. See, I love the night because it brings out the stars. And how does this all happen? I really don't know. I really don't know. I only know that it does. I can't tell you... I can't tell you how it happens. I want to witness and, and give you everything I have, but I can't tell you how it happens. But what I can tell you is why it happens. For God so loved the world. For God so loved you and me. For God so loved. That's the why. When you surrender... As God asks you to do, you will find his love to be stronger and stronger each and every day. And you'll see the promises of God come to light. Maybe not instantly in your life, but you'll start seeing it in others. You'll start clapping for others. For those that have kicked an addiction. 
or alcoholism or lying, whatever it might be, when we surrender in the nighttime of our life, God will open the door to the brightest sunshine you could ever see. That's his promises. I will as we let go. This is the word of the Lord. May God bless it to our understanding. And I hope each of you take John 3, 1 through 17, and tear it apart and see how much God loves you. Not just now, but he always has. Amen. But that's the kind of love that Jesus is. God is love. God has shown us love from the very beginning of creation. Solomon, one of the wisest men to ever live in his time, said, you cannot fathom what God has done for you from the very beginning. I could not fathom how much God loves me until I started walking in the night. Jesus in the night went and prayed. Talked to his father, saying, Lord, take this cup from me. That was night. He was going through his night moment of life, too. But he trusted God. And he surrendered. And the light came. A light that we can't put out. A light that's within us. If we just allow it. So as you come to this table today, let everything fall off. Be brave and walk into that mystery of night. And let yourself surrender. To the one who went to the cross. That's it. The one who sacrificed his blood and his body. Communion is about remembering what Jesus did for us. The Apostle Paul says that every time you eat and drink of this, you are proclaiming to the world around us who Jesus was, but also that Jesus will return. You know, in my life, when I was younger, I questioned, how do they know? But every promise that I have seen in the scriptures as I surrender myself to them, I know the promises are real. So I know this, in remembrance of him, is real. And that he will return. And all will be made new. At this moment, our deacons in a, will be distributing this bread of life, representing his body. I ask that you hold on to that until all that wants to be served are served and we can t partake of Holy Communion as a family. Different this time in the little green cups are small little wafers. Those are gluten-free. If you need one, please um, take one of those. If, if not, the regular bread is in there. So if I invite the deacons. And that this is the body of Jesus Christ. This is the body of Christ. This is the body of Jesus Christ. If you would go and serve.
condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the, by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do, the Spirit does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will certainly die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves to that, so that you can live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption the sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are indeed God's children. Now if we are children, then we are his heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. This is the word of the Lord found in Romans 8. Please be seated. Brenda, this is the body of Christ broken for you, Mark. Thank you, Mr. Jason. See, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Allison, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Jesus said, take and eat. Later in the supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks. 
and said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant. It is my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of your sin. What he is saying is, as we drink his blood and we accept his life, his suffering and his new life that he gives to us, we have been forgiven. It's your personal assurance how much God loves you. And so we take this as individuals to the forgiveness of your sin, Allison. Again, serving to you in his holy name are the deacons and elders of this church. Again, I ask that when you receive this, give thanks and know that you have been forgiven and God is with you. This is the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Brenda, this is the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. you would go and serve. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. For by grace, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many, many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to the other. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. If your gift is prophesizing, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is encouragement, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourself. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fever serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. 
live in unity and harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone for evil with evil. Be careful to do what is eyes right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. May it come to our understanding and be used. Amen. Be seated, please. Pray that this is the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Jesus says, Take ye and drink ye all of it. Let us be in the spirit of prayer. Almighty God, Father, your love that is beyond our full understanding, your mercy that is beyond our grasp, we give you thanks and praise. We follow, O oh Lord. May your mercy be with us. May your love guide us. And may our feet and our hands do your work here today in the world in which we live. Thank you, O oh Lord, for the substance that was given today, the mystery of life fulfilled through you. Almighty God, we give you thanks and praise. Amen. Would uh, get your hymnals once again and join me on page 344, Thou Art My Vision, and join with me as we sing our last hymn.
the Lord. Downstairs, there is coffee fellowship. I invite everybody down. There's plenty of food, plenty of fellowship, and plenty of coffee. So come on down. You want to blow it out? <laughs>